It's 15.30, so uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Special Recreational Facilities Advisory Board meeting for July 24th, 2019. I'd like to remind everyone we are web streamed and uh, for those in attendance, please silence your phones. We do have quorum, uh, so uh, we can carry on here. Uh, we'll go with the disclosure of pecuniary interest. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? If none, state no pecuniary interest declared. Gord, Ian, Sue. Amy, Crystal, and Chris, and Paul, no. Progress so far, uh, since January, we've uh, set our terms, created a Project Gantt chart outlining the process. We've uh, kind of expanded into advising uh, location selection. Uh, we, we've uh, developed clear location requirements. Uh, we've analyzed some potential sites, we've provided some viable locations to council, and uh, we've uh, re-engaged the community for a needs analysis. So I, I think we're, uh, we're making solid progress here as a board. Uh, right now we're waiting to hear back from county staff when site negotiations are completed so we can come up with a good announcement, and uh, we're uh, working hard on refining our facility requirements. Uh, we also need to uh, review our process plan and make sure that we're uh, uh, keeping on track. Ian uh, reminded us uh, the other day that uh, we do have a solid plan. We need to uh, get on with selecting a, pro a project manager. Uh, JJ reminded me last week we got to start looking at uh, four types of insurance very soon. And we have to uh, uh, come up and uh, advise council whether we should uh, be pursuing a design build or a more conventional construction bid process. We gotta get on with this uh, fairly soon. Uh, we also need to lay the groundwork for fundraising and uh, provide some guidance um, for intergovernmental funding applications. So we're working on that. And uh, finally, we need to communicate our plans to the citizenry and uh, Sue's working hard uh, with Matt uh, on that uh, with the staff. I hope today we can uh, move the stakes a little bit further forward. So, uh, agenda approval or changes. Uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to uh, a change on the agenda? Ian? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Is uh, Plus BG here today? They are. My question would be, would they be open to a question and answer session? Do we need to do that in uh, closed or open? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, w would you like to do that in closed session or open? In closed session? Okay. We'll, uh, we'll add that to uh, the closed session agenda then if we could. What's the nature of the questions, Arian? No, just general questions on where they are. I mean, they, that, that could be explained to us now like an open session, obviously. But uh, it's up to you. It doesn't really matter to me one way or the other. Okay. Well, how about we tackle that right, right ahead of the closed session, and that way if there is anything that starts uh, making us feel uncomfortable, we'll just take it into the other room. That's fine. Does that make sense? Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll throw that in. Ian? I have a second item, Mr. Chairman, for consideration. Uh, item C on the agenda, AMO opportunities, should that not perhaps be moved to follow item number six because there's some things that are going to be discussed uh, that may impact that uh, particular item. In other words, getting the information that's required. So, which I, which so you I'm wanna... suggesting it would follow the, um, the fundraising portion. Okay. Uh, do we need any report on that? Or? He just wants to move it to uh, the fundraising portion. Uh, he wants to move the AMO opportunity talking points. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll take that uh, after the uh, fundraising then. And uh, Sue, you you had your hand up. I'd like to just eliminate under C. No B. Number two and three. 
because they will come up after. Okay. Amy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wonder if the AMO, um, it would, it's coming from me, it will be very brief, if it will shape our discussion if it happens earlier rather than um, later. It, it just uh, you are aware of it, as is the Chair, but I haven't had an opportunity to speak to the group in whole about uh, the discussion today and why the meeting is a week earlier and whatnot. So my suggestion would be to deal with that earlier. Uh oh we have to have an arm wrestle now. Okay, uh, why, why don't we leave the, uh, the AMO opportunity uh, uh, a little bit earlier then and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, readdress it, we'll reattack it if, as required uh, afterwards. So we'll get the best of both worlds here. Okay, so uh, are we all, uh, we're all set with our agenda then? Can I have a motion to accept it? Okay, Sue, and seconded by Amy, all in favor? All right, let's carry on. Okay, so the project implementation process update. Uh, Ian, do you want to uh, take this on and uh, just kind of go through where we are and where we need to go? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to briefly uh, go over the so-called roadmap, which gave timelines throughout this project. Uh, I gave this document out at our last meeting in May, and I don't know if everybody read it, but I didn't bring out extra copies today. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to go through the next 10 items that are on the list sequential in terms of time uh, to get a better handle on this. When I prepared this originally, it did not have reference to uh, AMO uh, meeting and the, the items that needed to be ready for that, so I haven't inserted those, but they would be, they would be fitted in here somewhere. But I thought I'd just talk uh, very briefly on a few of them. So the development of the needs, obviously that's underway and hopefully that's going to be discussed in more detail today. And that basically is on time relative to how we f first started out. Uh, public funding and partnerships, that's an ongoing item. Also, we had preliminary financial analysis. Now this may be in part being done by plus VG now, I don't know, but again, we had it in there to be completed by the second quarter of the year. The other one was capital funds for land acquisition, obviously, uh, that's an item that council must be dealing with. Acquisition negotiations for preferred site, and that was to have started in the middle of the second quarter and be completed by the middle of the third quarter. So that's likely relatively close on, on meeting that time frame. Now, one item in here that is important is the studies related to the preferred site. We had put that in because council, we'd recommended that council should not necessarily uh, proceed to finalize a, everything in terms of a specific site until such times as those related studies, whether it be traffic, geotechnical, you name it, okay? And that was to be completed uh, by the end of the third quarter into the fourth quarter of this year. Then we had refine, uh, then council would approve the land acquisition and remove the conditions that would apply on the preferred site. Refine the project scope, again, uh, that was to be followed. Then an update on the preliminary cost estimate and to be included in the capital budget for the following year and so on. And then the other important item was the hiring of a project uh, manager. We had that identified to be done during the fourth quarter of this year. And I think some, we're going to speak to that today, maybe. And then prepare the detailed scope of work for expressions of interest. And then, of course, depending on how council wants to proceed, whether we're going to go over the conventional uh, method or design build. So I just wanted to focus on those few points because they're all in there in the next two quarters for the last part of this year. And I just reminded folks of that. Okay, and well, Mr. Chairman, that, that'll complete my uh, review unless somebody has some questions. Okay, uh, does anybody have any questions about the process uh, and uh, what it all entails there? No? Okay, uh, we're 
uh, it's a pretty involved project, and uh, it, it is a, uh, a significant sum of money uh, that we're uh, going to be charged with, uh, uh, you know, using to uh, come up with this good design. So we have to make sure that we follow a really rigorous process and make sure we do get uh, value for the money here. And uh, we're not going to be able to uh, pick up uh, the federal and provincial uh, portions of that money unless we follow a, a pretty rigorous process. I'm uh, going through the Treasury Board project uh, approval uh, directive right now for my own work, and uh, believe me, it, they, they put a lot of rigor into uh, anything over $10 million. Okay, thanks for that, Ian. Uh, we'll uh, take a look and uh, move on here to uh, the Communications Working Group uh, report. Uh, Sue, do you want to uh, talk to the uh, survey? Sorry, thanks, Mr. Chair. We put together a survey, sent it out via email, via social media, and we got responses back. And so what I did is I put together just a quick little slideshow to show the responses because I grouped what the groups wanted, the request. And the first one, and the biggest one was an indoor track. So something that people could use, and I've showed that the seniors could use it, even toddlers and all that, um, and use it during times throughout the whole day while their kids are at this facility. The next one is the pool. A little harder to see, but in the pool, the requirements were from diff multiple user groups, were a 50 meter pool with eight to 10 lanes, possibility of a warm-up pool. Um, big one was family change rooms and storage area. And if you look at some of these pictures here, you see um, competitive pool area, but you'll also see a ramp going down so that it's accessible to others. There is also a warm-up pool that has sometimes a slope that you can go into. Those are all just ideas, but there is also seating on the bottom picture there's seating so that there's gallery seating for people to watch. So that is one request. Not one request, multiple request. Because we wanted to keep it competitive, rec, leisure, and an exercise pool. The next one was the hockey rinks. Oops. And the big part of this one was the change rooms. Uh, making sure that they're more than just male, female. There's multiple change rooms, two rink pads, um, and that is replacing rinks in our area that are old. Another one was a multi-use gym. Now this is a big one, because a lot of the facilities, a lot of people came back, that it was tennis court, pickleball, badminton, volleyball courts, basketball, and the ability for volleyball and basketball to even host tournaments there is a need for an extra gym. Um, and if we could put a multi-use gym with three, possibly three gyms in it, that could be split for multi-use. And when we're looking at it, you could put multiple lines on the gym floors so that you could, um, so all groups, user groups could have access to this. And another one is storage again, comes back to storing community um, equipment. One is the baseball field at Memorial is used constantly, um, and they have a great number of kids at midget, junior, and senior age, and that would be an addition to, to add on the outside is another baseball field because they right now, through the summer, I know that they bring in multiple tournaments, 16 teams, but right now they have to cut it off at eight, and they have waiting lists to get into their tournaments and it's every weekend throughout the summer. And they're willing to also help by applying for Trillium grants. Oops. Okay, this one is multi-purpose rooms, and I grouped a lot of the groups in this, is there are meeting rooms that could be changed if we put the right flooring down, changed so that they could be activity rooms for seniors. It would be so easy to put in a shuffleboard room in there, um, you could create a dance studio where there would be ballroom dancing, 
There is storage along both sides of the, gym, the meeting rooms. Also, the other thing in the, each of these meeting rooms, some of them have sinks and water access, but a lot of them had storage along both sides for these groups, really. And that's what these groups need is storage. And we could do it with multiple clubs. Cards could be played in these rooms. Um, we, you don't want to be short on meeting rooms is what I'm seeing there. And the other is ho hosting conferences. If these multiple meeting rooms could be attached for a big conference room or not, okay? Another one came in with an interesting idea was the community kitchen, and the community kitchen could be um, used as part of the community college. I know right now Fanshawe can't host anything bigger because they don't have a facility, but we could have community um, leisure cooking classes, and outside there could be eating. And I found what was very interesting is creating eating spots for people, because when we come to the facility, we want to make it all use facility and welcoming and having areas for people can eat. And another one was a shared, um, the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation and Stonebridge Community Services, Crossing All Bridges, are three um, groups that have asked to be part of, they would like to create an accessibility and an inclusion area where they would have shared office space and that they would be able to run programs outside of this community, in the community hub, really. And I'm just gonna put you thinking outside the box part because of this being an all Norfolk community um, hub, there is different things that I th saw just recently is even a library kiosk that you order books online and you, there's a small little spot very small, just a wall and a checkout that you could go pick up library books. And it's creating about a, um, even a community connection with the library. Another one is in the two center pictures, and it's harder to see, is auditorium seating. And what you see is it's going down, and in the front of that is a big screen where you could host an event, or that could be a drop-down um, stage so that there could be different events that could be hosted for conferences and different um, groups could use that. As well in the far picture is um, also outdoor, but it could be used for indoor auditorium seating that is accessible for all. It has a ramp between the seating so that a wheelchair can go down. It saves the cost of an elevator and it gives an inclusion part of this. So it's something to think about when we're designing or thinking about it, uh, the hub. And the other thing that came out of the community user survey is repurposing the arenas. Um, there were some suggestions and there's multiple suggestions out there, but the ones that came is indoor soccer is looking for a facility to host some indoor games. Um, through the winter, they, would use, they have to turn away people. Um, I know Simcoe Minor Baseball is in the need of a facility. They lose multiple st um, athletes to other f um, city centers because we don't have the facility for an indoor training. There is the soccer, I mean, I've, soccer, tennis would like two indoor courts. Uh, pickleball could use daily, like during the day, they could use a court. So those are different ways that we could repurpose the arenas. There's also the market, there's also the arts as well. And with the survey in the chart that was handed out, there was a, a plethora of funding that's available too, that was given. That's all. Thanks, Sue. That's a, uh, a fairly uh, comprehensive shopping list. Did we get any uh, details from any of the organizations that uh, uh, specified uh, a track of uh, X meters or a pool of uh, uh, 50 meters. Uh, did they specify they wanted a therapy pool at uh, 104 degrees or anything like that? Uh, uh, were they, the user groups that specific? Uh, they were not that specific. There was the specific, the, was the walking track was four to six lanes. 
um, workout facility with spin bikes, treadmills was one, a 50 meter pool with eight to 10 lanes. Um, and there were no specifics, full, fully specific other than the 50 meter pool with eight to 10 lanes with a warm up pool as well. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for Sue? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so it's gonna be up to the uh, requirements working group to uh, put together some uh, details to those requests and see if we can come up with some kind of square footage uh, for that. Word. I'll probably be looking to you to uh, fill in some uh, hockey arena type stuff, but uh, we'll uh, be able to do some stuff. Go ahead. Just on that, uh, I do know I've been talking to the different hockey groups, and as an executive with the Simcoe Minor Hockey, there were some level of detail that was included. Hockey Canada is changing a lot with regards to the boarding system, the half ice, the cross ice ho uh, hockey. That's now encompassing 40% of the players. The dressing room requirements, not just male, female, but gender identity flexibility. Uh, with regards to the seating in the arenas, what works and doesn't work, there are layers of technical you know, requirements uh, or asks that would, be uh, that would be needed for that. And, and I think whether it's the arenas or these other groups, as we get into those weeds, we can reach back out uh, to them, yeah. I would hope, to make sure we get those details. Well, I think we should try to start collating all that information at the very next requirements working group meeting so that we can kind of come up with a square footage. I know with uh, gender-based analysis being... Uh, uh, a very, very important thing in the Ontario's with Disabilities Act uh, being very, very important as well. We have uh, a lot of space considerations that uh, we, we may not have thought of in the old uh, designs, so we do have to uh, account for all of that. Are there any other comments for the communications working group? Okay, Amy, I guess uh, you're up for the AMO opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for uh, calling an early meeting and thanks everyone for coming a week earlier. Um, Mayor Chop and I will be attending the AMO conference uh, with uh, um, co content from staff on all areas and all community projects. And obviously the All Norfolk Community Hub is a massive initiative that we plan to go uh, quite aggressively to Ottawa. Just for the audience, uh, can you describe what the AMO is? The yes, I can. It's the Association of <laughs> Association of uh, Municipalities of Ontario. Thanks. So we're headed to um, the conference in Ottawa, where we will find out our meeting dates one week before attending. So we do not have confirmation that we're going to be able to sit down with the Minister of Infrastructure um, at this point in time. However, um, I can can assure you that Mayor Chop and I will be aggressively advocating for that and doing our best to discuss the community hub when we get there. We need to be prepared either way though, and staff have been working diligently on creating uh, reports and presentations on all topics to take with us. So we need to come um, very prepared and we need to put our best foot forward with the square footage of what our facility will, will be, um, as well as the a general figure, a price, a dollar value to go and articulate. And then lastly, some drawings to show proof of concept and what we're trying to do here. Um, so staff have been working very hard, very quickly on short notice to help get prepared. That's why we have Plus VG here with us today who are going to help us uh, get the ball rolling. But that was the reason for one, um, having this meeting one week earlier and I hope that that can kind of shape our discussion. We obviously have a lot of wants and, and asks and needs in this um, and I think it's evident that we need to manage our expectations but we also have a job to do I think that is um, looking to the future of what potential growth can be accommodated in this facility and are we going to be prepared for that? Do we need to be prepared for that in the next year, two, three years and put everything under the sun into this community hub? No, but we do need to be prepared for it. So um, thank you again for the early meeting date and I look forward to pushing this forward. Okay, uh, thank you. and. Uh uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, last week was just trying to make sure that uh, uh, our two uh, uh, city representatives 
uh, are well armed with talking points with respect to the hub. So to that end, uh, we tried to come up with at least three and hopefully we'll come up with a few other things that will really help differentiate our hub from Tecumseh, from all the other unfunded hubs right now. So uh, we started looking at things like the Fanshawe uh, Lincoln and uh, the partnership that we're going to be developing and growing with Fanshawe in this area. Um, JJ is leading our green, uh, our green effort, but uh, yeah, we, we, we definitely want to uh, push uh, the environmental stewardship of the land as well as the, uh, the greenness of the building. Um, and uh, the other thing that we really want to try and uh, focus on, I think, is uh, trying to bring uh, downtown Simcoe's uh, revitalization into the, into the topic. Um, there are some other good things that we can talk about uh, um, with gender-based uh, uh, analysis uh, being a very uh, key buzzword in uh, the federal level. Um, we can also talk about uh, um, women in sport and uh, the representation of women in sport is uh, below that of men right now. But uh, we're building a facility here that happens to have the number one uh, women's sport uh, in it, and that's swimming. So uh, we're, we're doing something to really try and equalize uh, the, uh, the, the uh, balance between uh, male, female, and gender uh, nonspecific uh, uh, people by building this new facility and improving the pool. So that, that's another good speaking point that you can uh, talk about there. Anybody have anything else to uh, discuss uh, about the AMO meeting? Excellent. Requirements discussion. Uh, does anybody have uh, anything to uh, bring to the requirements table? Outside of what we've talked about, uh, we welcome any details uh, uh, such as uh, rink sizes, change room sizes, what they're doing for uh, male, female, and uh, gender neutral uh, uh, change room facilities there. Uh, I've been doing some uh, research online looking at uh, UBC's uh, change room facility setup, and uh, uh, they have gender non specific shower areas, clearly with bathing suits, but, uh, and lockers going into the pool, so it's very interesting, and it, it is an evolving uh, status. So maybe that's something that we can uh, kind of leverage as we come up with our design. Okay, uh, nobody has anything else. Uh, we'll uh, try and take this, uh, well, actually, Ian, this is where you were uh, gonna ask some questions of our uh, consultants. For the record, really all I want to know is the process in terms of what the objective of uh, plus VG is, and I think Shelley likely can clarify that. Um, because I just want to make sure that how it flows into the work that we're doing in terms of our overall schedule and the timing and so forth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with respect to your question, uh, uh, Mr. Neville, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Paul, uh, Ed Bordeaux and Kevin Church, both with Plus VG today. They're here to hear your discussion on requirements and components uh, for the All Norfolk Community Hub. Uh, they have been retained by Norfolk County to complete some uh, artist renderings, some uh, collection concept. Um, of the All Norfolk Community Hub so that Mayor Chop and Councillor Martin can uh, make some significant presentations at the AMO conference. There is a, a very tight turnaround for the work to be completed by Plus VG. So they have been retained, uh, as I said, and as Councillor Martin reiterated earlier today, uh, to do those uh, concept designs. So any, certainly, feedback from a component or a requirement perspective would be essential to give to these folks today so that they can uh, continue with their work that they will be doing over the next uh, 10 days. Well, thank you uh, for that. I think uh, if, uh, if, if we need to try and uh, fulfill the, some input into uh, the design 
today, then uh, I guess uh, we're going to have to revisit our requirements discussion a little bit here and uh, try and throw some ideas out to you guys so that you have, uh, you, you have some ideas of well, what our ideas are anyway. Um, do you guys have any opening remarks or anything uh, you, you'd like to say? Well, um, uh, actually, since we're, since we're going to have a little bit of a back and forth here, why don't we uh, I invite you up to the mic or uh, bring a mic to you, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, but uh, I, I think there should be uh, some, some discussion on this so that we can figure out, do we need to provide you square foots and number of change rooms, or do we need to just say we want X number of rinks, X, X number of pools, X number of meeting spaces, that kind of thing. So. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we talked uh, last week in our working group uh, meeting just a little bit about, uh, you know, cost per square foot, and I don't know if that's a reasonable measure for a building. I've been looking at uh, everything from the London Olympics swimming pool to Rio's pool to, uh, you know, little, uh, little college pools and, uh, and city pools down in the States, which are not so little uh, in a lot of cases. But... Uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to the architectural design and what we're going to put into that. And clearly we have a budget, so uh, we, we have to be uh, a, uh, very cognizant of our fiduciary duty on this. We're not going to uh, uh, be building the next Rio Stadium. So, yeah, uh, sure. I'm going to say something, but I better say something. <laughs> So one thing that I didn't hear was a senior center. And yeah, and that has to be um, part of this, you know, considering the fact that 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 wasn't stated, but it looks like maybe the multi-use and some of the other facilities might accommodate that. But definitely the current square footage of the senior center and Bill's been talking to the uh, group of what you probably need for this phase one. You know, we in Brampton built a, a pool and we were probably talking about 540 to 600 per square foot, which would be less in Norfolk, but um, as well as arenas at about 500. So I think that if you look at what Tecumseh's putting forward, you probably can't go beyond 130,000 to 150,000 square feet for this complex to be under that 60 million threshold. So maybe those are some parameters you could work on in this requirements. And Bill, I don't know if you had anything else. No, through the chair. No, I thank you for that, Harry. The seniors did stand out that it wasn't mentioned, but it's always meant to be the plan. And um, you're right. Rather, we kind of get tied up on what our ultimate goal is to have into this. But presently, if we've taken the square footage of, of Talbot, the rec center, and, and add 20,000 square feet for us seniors, we're at about 150,000 square feet. And if you base that on the numbers that uh, Harry had talked about and we've explained, that comes out pretty close to the numbers we have talked about. Um, but with that said, even in Talbot, the space probably isn't laid out as, as nicely or as efficiently as it could be, same as the rec center, that, that sort of thing. But um, no, I, I totally agree with what, what Harry says. It, it kind of brings a little bit of concept into this before, before we move, move on and give the consultants some guidance with that. Yeah, we definitely have to uh, make sure that the seniors have uh, uh, a portion of space that is uh, is theirs, and then uh, we can probably figure out a way to share some multi-room space with uh, seniors and other user groups as well. So that's uh, that, that's something that uh, we'll try and pass on to Plus VG. Amy, 
uh, seniors have been consulted through this process and that is information that staff does have. Uh, just want to bail Sue out here for a, for a moment. She, she did you know, connect with them. But this was, this was information specifically from our survey. But I think it, that's a great point. There are a lot of things that we're not talking about right now that we really need to drill down on how much information we want to iron out today. Um, Childcare, commercial space, um, outdoor spaces. I just don't think that's all completely relevant to get us aim already, uh, but it is a conversation about how the square footage of the overall building and exactly what you said, the, or sorry, maybe Bill said it, the efficiency of the layout. I just wanted to bail Sue out there. Go ahead. Um, just a point of clarification. When you say the rec center, are you talking about the rec center ice? Or are you talking the rec center with the pool? Through the chair, Com complete building. Yep, yep. Yeah. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Apologize for my lateness. Um, my question through you, I believe I'm going to direct it towards Bill. Um, and if someone else would like to, to chime in, I believe we were originally talking about possibly having a therapy pool as well. And um, maybe like the way I like to start the conversation, and I, d I don't see it in the requirements list, and I'm not too sure if that's uh, something that's been explicitly stated or if that's... Um, we're operating based on an assumption that it could be an option for us. But what a therapy pool is, it's a very small piece of water, uh, basically something the size uh, that you could get a treadmill in. Uh, you use it for those who have lost the use of uh, their mobility. It allows them not only to experience the sensation of walking again or being buoyant in water. Uh, so it is a, a very nice amenity for our seniors and our elderly, uh, and also those that uh, suffer from a disability that's physical. Uh, in addition to that, those that have experienced a sports injury, they're actually able to do some rehabilitative therapy uh, to heal that sports injury in this type of pool. It's a pretty small footprint, and I know that there's been some successful examples in some other wellness complexes. I had an opportunity, um, it seems like a lifetime ago, but when I was going to school in uh, St. Catharines, I had an opportunity to volunteer at the Welland community wellness complex and they actually have a hot therapy pool in that location doctors are able to rent the space and bring their clients in and it was a real boon um, for their facility they took an old retirement home uh, that was i believe rosewood senior living and they turned it into a multi-use multi-generational uh, community center and part of uh, that uh, revamp and that rebuild was uh, building the therapy pool in uh, to their aquatic center, and I think that that would be a nice amenity for us to explore. Uh, and I guess my question through you uh, to Bill was, is this something that we're still considering? Um, and again, I just kind of want to dispel the myths, because many people think, you know, therapy pool, their, their, their brain sometimes goes to a, f a full-length pool that's going to be heated, and that's not what I would picture uh, a therapy pool looking like. It's a, it's a smaller amenity, and really it has a very uh, niche and very specific purpose. Thanks for that. Uh, th th that's an interesting concept. I hadn't thought about individual uh, 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 therapy pools uh, as much as a, uh, um, what, I, what I had in mind uh, was behind a 10 lane 50 meter pool. 10 lanes just happens to be exactly 25 meters across, by the way. So you could put sideways a four lane uh, warm, much warmer pool. What, what we end up doing right now at uh, Annalise Carr Aquatic Center is on Wednesdays, uh, we superheat it. Um, that, that pool could maintain that temperature and it would be a 25 meter pool. So it would have be multi-use uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the people who like uh, the heat. And then uh, that would be perfectly aligned with a 10 lane 50 meter pool. So it, uh, aesthetically, it's a, it's a nice match, too. But the interesting thing, um, based on Brantford's current, uh, uh, current uh, possessions in, in, uh, in, in swimming lanes, not, uh, not Brant Park, not, uh, not Earl Haig, but uh, just talking about the existing pools that they have right now, they have uh, a 65-meter pool that's eight lanes, They've got uh, a 25-meter pool that's eight lanes. Uh, that's both in the, the Wayne Gretzky pool. 
and then they've got another 25 meter pool that's eight lanes in the in the new YMCA and if you take their population and divide that by the number of meter lanes that they have it turns out to be 106.7 people per meter lane and I only bring that up because I was fascinated to find out that if we built a 10 lane 50 meter pool in Norfolk and added four lane 25 meter therapy pool to it that uh, and we take our 2016 population of 64,044 and divide it by that uh, that number we end up with 106.7 people per meter lane so that to me indicates that we are competing with our neighboring county in terms of uh, access to the space so I thought that was an interesting statistic that helped uh, uh, make the case for a 50 meter pool it sounds like we have enough groups that have also made the case so uh, you know I think the demand is there uh, in terms of gender equality in sport it's there uh, we have uh, we have a lot of good reasons to uh, to, to uh, argue for a 50 meter pool and some kind of therapy pool and quite possibly uh, you know we might have an individual uh, even hotter pool I don't know I've never considered that but it's uh, it's worth uh, uh, plus VG taking a look at for sure and seeing what the additional cost is it might only be ten thousand twenty thousand dollars for uh, you know a therapy pool like that it might be a very unique feature in the in the area might be something that attracts those doctors to this area we don't know thank you for that mr. chair uh, I, I think that that's it. we're on the same page here the warm-up pool could very well uh, double as a as a therapy pool um, I, I envision you know having a sling at the end um, for those uh, to get lowered in and, and making it fully accessible and uh, if we, we could have that option just to explore it at least uh, through the consultants that that would satisfy you know m my curiosity uh, at least because I think it would be a wonderful amenity for us to at least explore if not commit to well the, the I think the uh, the, the uh, AOD act uh, kind of forces us to uh, to look at all of that kind of stuff and it will be a, there, there's no question it will be an accessible facility uh, with, all, with respect to everything so uh, we just have to, uh, uh, you know, th th that's a given. It's not a. It's not an option. Is there anything else we uh, need to discuss on requirements, Ian? Mr. Chairman, um, I guess just one clarification. Um, in terms of the uh, detailed scope of work for expressions of interest, if in fact we go that route, how much of the work before the dis the uh, August 10th deadline and that in our plan we have that in the month of December to finalize that um, is this still fit in with everything that you want in terms of AMO I think the biggest thing for AMO is just you know we wanted some some preliminary drawings for some, for some talking points I mean we've got 10 minutes with these guys it's it's to start a conversation it's to show that we're moving forward it's not that we need the specifics you know it's a high level for, for me like I think what's going to capture their interest is what's going to make our hub different than everybody else's and we have an opportunity here to you know leapfrog ahead of what everyone else is doing because we can learn from all of their mistakes and so on I think for me like a, a big component of is, is how is the exterior going to be you know I want something unique and different that you know works with our environment and you know has you know more than just lead concepts but you know that to me is it's almost more that kind of fantasy piece a little bit but with reality I mean and we can make the adjustments from there as as you guys progress further along in, in your working group right I mean it's 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 just a concept at, at this stage so so we can say hey we're doing it like we're you know and and, and look at what's different about ours and, and this is why it's going to be great but we are still you know finalizing and so on this isn't like you know we're ready to go to a design build tender here or anything well we do we do live in a very interesting time and uh, you know I've, I've been looking at these uh, these buildings since I was a kid and uh, you go into the Tobico Olympium it's a six-sided box with no windows and uh, it feels like you're in a, a bit of a cave when you enter it 
and then uh, you, you go into some modern facility like the uh, the London Canada Games Aquatic Centre and it's glass on both ends, it feels light and airy. Um, I think we can definitely uh, harness um, a more modern look and feel to the building and uh, make sure that it, it, it's harmonious with the environment, both exterior and interior, without breaking the budget, I think. Sue, you had your finger up. Go ahead. Um, I think one of the requirements would be that we would harvest daylight savings. That would be a very... I would also like to see as well is if we could make this, um, I want to say zero carbon, after being at Mohawk College and seeing all how they have done that, and they have used wa rainwater to capture that rain rainwater to filter out and to flush the systems, um, that would be something innovative. I think we also want to look at there, I thought was a really brilliant idea there was the geothermal heating, because it took up less um, floor space there. Um, and what it did is it opened up more spacing for the meeting rooms, computer rooms, all that to be used. They also use solar too um, in their rooms, I mean above their building. And I think that's something that we need to do is be innovative when we create this um, hub. Um, the other thing is I think we need to be innovative on how we present the outside, not a normal outside in the sense of we do not want just a building, we want to make that grounds around it to be very inviting so that we're, in, we're creating a community hub that all people want to come. I'm talking young, I'm talking teenagers, I want to see adults, I want to see seniors all together in one roof that we're using the wisdom of our elders and we're using the children there, that we create a, um, a community, almost. And that we create, in this hub, I think one of the things we wanna do is be visionary of where we can create eating areas, where we can re create little meeting areas that we could gather together, um, inside and outside of this hub, even. Those are just some of the visionary kind of things I think that we need to promote. We also look, have to look at all the green, that, how we can be green with this. Crystal. Well, I think Sue hit it you know, on the head there that a big component of this is the, the exterior as well. I mean, to me, so many of these facilities, you show up and it's just the building with a parking lot and the building might be phenomenal, but that's the extent of it. And Amy and I just had a meeting yesterday with uh, Young and Free Press, and as they're looking at building, you know, Fanshawe's agricultural program, one of the challenges is they're bringing international students and stuff over, but I mean, people can't, those kids can't afford to go and buy a farm. And so what, where are they going to use that knowledge that they've gained at Fanshawe? And so we have to start looking whether you know, there's setups for them to, you know, become food vendors and, you know, maybe having a market there, like a farmer's market there as well, integrating that kind of thing. But so I think that's what's going to distinguish this in these drawings, like from these guys, that's what we're looking for is that, it, that so exterior, that combination of yeah. it all, not so just here's, here's the building and this is what we're going to put in it. You know, everybody knows, okay, pool, you know, rink's great, but... What, it'd, be neat, what's, it'd be very neat in the artist concept to see yeah. like a food truck court or something uh, and try and uh, encourage uh, uh, the, the dining experience. Coming, co come to your community hub and uh, you know have have a, have a nice uh, outdoor meal and uh, spend some uh, quality time with your community. Sue, I do really want to go hit also this part is the accessibility for seniors. And not just seniors, but those who are in um, wheelchairs and walkers. Because I know that um, after much discussion with some people is one of the difficulties that people have that are in wheelchairs or walkers is bathroom accessibility right at the door. Because that, that is one thing that I think we need to be innovative in too because that limits who can come, right? And we need to have that. That's that's one of them. And uh, again, uh, uh, I can't say it often enough, I guess, but uh, uh, the, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act will uh, 
uh, it's not an option. It's, uh, we, we just have to build a, an accessible facility. And, you know, being as creative as we can so that, let's say, there's not even a door to go through, just a, a weaving passage um, for the privacy aspect of things, that, that, that helps, that kind of thing. Two. And one other thing I was thinking is um, we have, if we had office space or small little meeting rooms in this where parents could meet with their speech path so that they could have a speech pathology while their child's in swimming lessons, where um, a physiotherapist could rent out a room, as you say, like the therapy, to give therapy in this. So not to be um, close thinking of just a community center, but creating little office spaces that could be rented for certain individuals even. Well, I think uh, having a commercial aspect to this is uh, very valuable. If you go to the Belleville, uh, the, the Belleville hub uh, up near the 401, um, you enter a grand foyer that runs uh, four hockey rinks long, and then at the far end, there is a wall of commercial physiotherapy and massage therapy and uh, doctors uh, all uh, all centered around uh, athletics and uh, and the active uh, community so I think having that in the future we, we, we can't be all things to all people in uh, with, with you know our, our plan 60 million but we can definitely um, start generating the thought processes so that Commercial uh, commercial partnerships can be made in the future, and we've got that room for growth. We haven't closed off ourselves to that room for growth. And we're not saying anything uh, uh, that, that you know some other community is not saying. Yeah, I'm sure, but uh, the, these are things that we've discussed over the last uh, six months, and uh, we're just trying to capture them here for Plus VG one more time. Anything else? Great. Plus VG, have you guys got any uh, comments, questions, looking for clarification? Yeah, sorry, Ian's got a, a, a hearing uh, a disability. He needs a little bit. Just with regards to arenas, my question is, is how many seats? You know, is one of the arenas larger than the other? So many seats? Like that gives us an idea of what to create kind of in that space. Gord, have you got that answer? I know Bill does if you don't. Well, Bill can probably fill in some of the the, the, the holes. Uh, right now, we have Talbot Arena, which has excellent bowl, seat, bowl seating, and you have the rec center, which has essentially no seating whatsoever. I think that from those in the hockey community that I've been discussing, expect one primary rink, both NHL size, as you uh, referred to earlier, one primary rink with full seating, particularly down to the, very much like Talbot, down to the ice level, uh, is, is excellent for, for viewing, and that's your predominant feature game rink, if you will and then more of a secondary rink, still with seating. You still need to have that seating in the secondary rink, but obviously you're more weighted to uh, the primary week for your, for your larger games. And I'm not sure the seating in Talbot, uh, Bill might have a better idea what the capacity is there, but something that is at least that big for a new arena. Through, through the chair, no, um, the board member um, Gord is pretty well right on. We would expect the, the full seating approximately um, 800 to 1,000 in the main arena, and then the secondary arena, which we can call the practice arena for now, you know, probably half of that, anywhere from, you know, around the 400 mark is what we're seeing in these. So generally that's one side seating in that and, and the bowl seating in, in the main arena is, is what staff envision. And uh, in terms of uh, the, the gymnasium, uh, we, we'd probably want some kind of pull-out bleacher system set up uh, down one long side of that. Uh, in terms of the swimming facility and spectator seating, the Aquatic Sport Council of Ontario has got uh, some excellent uh, guidelines on everything from uh, 
the, uh, the dining facility size, the change room size, and the, uh, the spectator seating uh, requirements for a regional level competition pool. We're not looking to uh, host the next Olympics or uh, Canadian Nationals, so we don't have to meet uh, the high-end FINA guidelines there. But uh, trying to meet regional competitions will definitely spur uh, a tournament, uh, uh, tournament style spin-offs from this project. Gord, you had your hand up. Hey, maybe this is just too detailed for what you need, but in full agreement with what Bill also mentioned in terms of seating capacity, the foyer, uh, a lot of the new facilities that are servicing multiple rinks and pools, etc. it's critical for some of the groups we've talked to with regards to that being large enough. I know we're talking about square footage. It needs to be a very large space for all the tournaments, etc. all that traffic flow, but also needs to be situated in such a way that you can still gate an event. Um, you have to have that control over people. Um, and then the new aspect with regards to the arena is any innovative design with regards to the portable boards and netting that now has to be used very regularly on a day-to-day -day, day basis and how that integrates with your flexible change room uh, layout. So those are pretty critical pieces that weren't there 20 years ago, but are definitely there today. I'm a little bit worried that this is maybe like too much minutia for right now because we're not going to be talking about the seating capacity at AMO again. Like just high level, like edgy, you know, what that, that, those pieces that are going to differentiate us and whether we have a thousand seats or 2,000 seats, I don't, you know, know that they're going to care at AMO. Yeah. Possibly not, but, and that's where my second comments were probably too minutia, but in terms of that seating and the square footage is my concern and the foyer, the same thing. When we're laying out something that's going to fit within our projected budget, I think one or two thousand seats would be significantly impactful to that budget range. Do you guys have the uh, the information you need to uh, get your artistic? Uh... Nobody talked about diving. Is anybody doing any consideration to do any diving at this pool? We haven't had any, uh, any impetus towards uh, putting in a dive well or a 10-meter tower or anything like that. I think uh, we, we would have to have a pretty strong demand in the county to, uh, to warrant that kind of expense at this point. That, that, that uh, increases expense in roof. Uh, it increases expense uh, with concrete and towers and uh, depth of pool and everything else. So we haven't seen that yet. If there's any divers watching, uh, you better speak up soon. <laughs> Just one other question. I know Fanshawe was mentioned. Is there anything size-wise that Fanshawe is looking at possibly, or is it just a matter of using the facility only? Uh, thank you through uh, the chair and through Mayor Chop. I think at this point uh, we, we don't want to overwhelm plus VG. Uh, they weren't expected to do a question and answer today. Uh, they have been given a, a deliverable for some artist rendering, some simple pictures to get us to AMO. Um, all of these details will follow as we progress through the, the process, um, but we do want to respect their time and, uh, and the work that they need to get done on these preliminary uh, drawings. Uh, so I think there is enough information. I don't want to cut off Mr. Church, uh, but certainly any follow-up questions that they may have, we can take those questions and get the appropriate responses. Okay, uh, uh, if that's uh, the end of uh, our requirements discussion, I'd like to push us into, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say, Ian, you said December. All hands are on deck, though, if the feds come up with uh, the grant writing required. The election's October 21st or 19th. So if James gets a, a heads up on the green infrastructure fund or the other infrastructure fund, the $30 billion over the next 10 years, and we have to fill something out by September 20th, all hands are on deck to make sure we, we do that. So it might not be December. It might might be when, when those requirements come in from the federal government on, on when those grants are due. So just a, just a heads up. Might not be December, it might be earlier. Ian. No, it might be earlier. That, that roadmap we provided to everybody 
was a guesstimate based on background experience and normal processes. I mean, if you're expediting because of, of that funding application, yeah, that may need or necessitate advancing some of that work. But there is a lot of work to be done, and I don't want to under, understate that. Thank you. Okay, at this time, can I have a motion that the Recreational Facilities Advisory Board move into closed session at, uh, call it 4.32 p.m. to discuss matters pursuant to Section 239, Charlie, of the Municipal Act 2001, as amended as the subject matter pertains to a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board? Ian. Seconded. Cord. All in favor? Moved. Okay, we're going to go into closed session. Uh, we should be uh, done in uh, no, no more than 15 or 20 minutes.
welcome back. Uh, can I have a motion that the Recreational Facilities Advisory Board recess the closed session at, uh, call it 4.46 p.m. and reconvene in open session? Chris and Ian, all in favor? Oh, <laughs> I didn't get all my hands there. That's, the, I think, the first uh, non-unanimous vote we've ever had. Okay. All right, we're moved on. Uh, Gord gave me a quick, uh, quick note. There's nothing uh, to really report in the fundraising. Uh, we're uh, kind of waiting on this uh, AMO uh, meeting to find out uh, what we're getting uh, uh, in terms of interest from at the provincial level. And uh, I have a little bit of news. Uh, uh, I'll be uh, uh, approaching uh, our MP uh, in the not too distant future to uh, discuss uh, this project as well. Crystal, have you had any engagement with Diane at all? Uh, I mean, I see her all the time at events and stuff, and mm -hmm. certainly we've talked about it and so on. Yep. I, think, um, I, I am aware she, that uh, her late she, husband was a, a big proponent she, of she the is, Center of She Excellence. is certainly on board. Good, good. Well, hopefully... Uh, Catching as my a, drift. <laughs> yeah, as former uh, Treasury Board Chair, uh, she can probably help us navigate the uh, federal she government. She definitely could. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, any uh, any other comments on the uh, fundraising? Okay. Uh, so we, we're supposed to have uh, a meeting next week on Monday. What's so funny over there? <laughs> we're supposed to have a meeting on Monday, but uh, I think we've covered off all the business that we need for Monday uh, as a board. But I'd like to... Uh, uh, proposes that we break uh, Monday's meeting into uh, working groups and if uh, if we have enough interest uh, in the uh, at the board level to uh, participate in the requirements working group we can certainly hold it in public session but otherwise we'll uh, we'll just have uh, some sub quorum uh, uh, working groups on Monday at 3:30 and we'll meet here we'll focus primarily on uh, requirements initially uh, Gord and I are going to meet uh, to talk about the uh, the fundraising, and uh, Sue, you're more than welcome to have a, a communications working group if you wish. Does that sound like a solid plan? Do we need a motion on that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, let you know. That. Um, for the requirements, is it? possible that we could get uh, plus VG back for the uh, requirements working group meeting? Or uh, do you think they have all the guidance they need uh, at this point? Well, I'll, I'll leave that to Shelley, but I think we're both thinking um, they're probably not going to be available. Uh, through the chair, likely not available on that short notice. And we just, I'm cautious of what is in their scope of work. And it and it's clearly not a lot of uh, consultation and meeting time. So we have to be cognizant of what their intended uh, uh, project scope is at this point in time. Well, that's a great point, And thank you for that segue, because uh, um, we, we are finding that uh, uh, the board is supposed to try and steer the ship, but uh, there, there's a few aspects of this that uh, um, are kind of a little bit of a surprise here. So we just have to make sure that uh, the board is uh, aware of what the scope is for plus VG so that we don't overtask or overask from them. Um, you know, uh, I just want to make sure that we have uh, the tools we need to properly give advice to council. Uh, and make sure that we are steering this thing in, in the right direction. Uh, okay, so the meeting on the 29th uh, will just be working groups, and I think we're ready to adjourn today's meeting. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Ian. Really quick. Go ahead, so Crystal. just so we're clear, so I think that the working groups, everything should just proceed as you guys were proceeding. We just wanted, it was a very, very, very small contract with them to just do some sort of arc, like just some rendering, some photos, so that when we go to AMO, if we are lucky enough to get a meeting with these guys, you know, we can, we can sort of give a very high level. That's why even down to the seats, I just don't think it's, it's critical at this point. You know, I want you guys to take, take your time as you would and get the requirements 
you know, in place, and then we will modify. There is nothing there that won't be unmodifiable to suit the new requirements. Kind well, of that, thing. and that's that's kind of the guidance that uh, we we need as a board because Plus VG is also a design build firm, and if they're bidding, we need to make sure we get as much detail to them as early as possible so that they get the right bid. But if they're just if they're just hired on as uh, conceptual artists right now, then uh, I think you know, what we've given them is more than sufficient. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the risk is, uh, you know, if if we end up using them for more stuff, then, uh, you know, uh, you know, there, there's the flag of conflict of interest, but there's also uh, issues with respect to have they got all the detail that we wanted to get to them early enough so that they didn't start uh, turning this whole thing pear-shaped. Sue? Just for a point of clarification, it's the AMO that you're going to, we'll find out the funding. At that point, like, you'll have a conversation. We are still picking a location, right? And figuring out, like the particulars are still a little bit away off, right? Okay. There's gonna be no decision on, on funding at AMO. Yeah. It's, it's just a matter of you know getting some face time there and showing what we're doing in Norfolk and you know getting people talking about it kind of thing so that they know it's coming. All right. Final comments before we adjourn? Mover for adjournment. Sue, seconder. Amy, all in favor. Okay, the, uh, the next uh, official RFAB meeting is also falling on a, uh, a, a statutory holiday. So we're bumping it up one week again to August 26, 2019. So that will be the next uh, official RFAB uh, gathering. Thank you very much. <laughs>